Okay, I think we're ready to start. So, um, look, welcome everybody to uh, our conversation tonight. Between myself, Frank Bongiorno, Head of School of History, and Amanda Larguson uh, on her new book, which I will hold up for you, uh, Rooted, uh, An Australian History of Bad Language, published by New South um, Books. Uh, I'd like to begin uh, with uh, acknowledgement of the traditional owners, um, the land on which we're meeting, the Ngunnawal and the Yambri people, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Um, I'd also, uh, before we start, just like to warn you that our session tonight is being recorded. Um, we'll basically follow a format where uh, Amanda and I will talk for about uh, probably something like 30, 35 minutes, uh, and then we'll open the session for um, questions. There is a and a function um, on Zoom, which uh, you should have in front of you. Uh, so not long um, before we uh, finish our actual conversation, I'll invite you to start posting some questions there um, so that I can direct those to um, Amanda in the, the last part of the session. And finally, um, I, I, I've never had to do this before, I think, but I have to offer here a language warning. Now, this isn't because you know, Amanda and I are talking tonight. We don't normally issue language warnings for our sessions, but the nature of the book obviously means that there could be uh, some slightly blue language to use an old fashioned term. Uh, so uh, just be, be warned that, uh, um, you know, we, we won't be discussing a little golden book or, or uh, anything along those lines. So um, um, welcome Amanda, congratulations on, on the book which has already had lots of, um, uh, you know, thoroughly uh, deserved publicity, which is terrific. Um, I just wanted to ask you, you know, how you became interested in this topic. Um, do, do you have a foul mouth yourself, I suppose? I should, might ask. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. <laughs> um, yeah, I will, yeah, firstly, thanks to, to Frank, both for, um, engaging in this conversation. Um, I couldn't think of a, a better person to talk that language with. Um, and Frank also was one of the people who read the draft of the book for which I am very grateful he gave me some excellent feedback. So I'd very much like to acknowledge Frank. Um, okay, so how did I become interested in this topic? Well, I guess there are two primary motivators. Um, one is my ongoing research into the history of Australian English, um, both in terms of the work that we do on the Australian lexicon, the Australian National Dictionary, but also my long-standing interest in thinking about attitudes towards language and attitudes um, around Australian English, Australian slang and so on. So this was kind of one component of that. Um, and uh, I continue to do um, that, that broader research project. The other motivator, I guess, was more a kind of writing challenge. So um, for those of you who have any familiarity with any of the past <laughs> books that I've written, <laughs> um, some of them are just, let's, shall we say, quite niche, um, quite scholarly, very archivally driven, probably read by about, you know, 10 people in the world. <laughs> I'm sure that's not true. I really There's a couple of them, I think, that would definitely fall into that um, basket. And I've enjoyed working on those, and that's been great. but. I, I guess I sort of set myself a challenge of writing something that would be um, for a broader audience and really engage people with new ways of thinking about um, swearing and about Australian English more generally. And to write something that really was based upon synthesizing a wide range of primary and secondary sources across, you know, following a theme through, and, you know, you'd know from your book on, on sex lives that, you know, following that theme through a much broader sweep rather than something that was very much driven by, you know, deep work in, in one or two archives. So it was kind of a writing challenge for me um, to see how that went. Um, you know, did it succeed? I don't know, but um, that was, that was what I wanted to do. Yes, really are a filthy pair, aren't we? I wrote a book on sex and you've done one on swearing. Yeah. And maybe we could get together and do one on, you know, getting pissed or something next. So there's any number of possibilities. Um, you've called the book Rooted, which I guess is how many of us feel at the moment, at the end of 2020, as we sort of stumble towards the, the, the finish line. I remember when I was researching my book on the 1980s and I was I had a section in on the America's Cup and um, uh, Ronald Reagan, President Ronald Reagan, had sent to the New York Yacht Club team 
a, a, a message, you know, for the, the final race said, saying that um, Nancy and I are rooting hard for you, which uh, caused, I believe, some mirth amongst the Australians present in, uh, in Rhode Island at the time. I mean, I take it that is, in fact, a distinctive Australian swear word, is it? Yes, well, I was hoping you would, would tell that, that anecdote that you told me the other day. Um, and for those of you watching the, the doc, new documentary on the Reagans, this might give you a new perspective on yeah, yeah, yeah. Ron and Nancy. Um, but yeah, I mean, one of the reasons I chose that, I have to say my, my original working title was not here to fuck spiders, but um, I figured that probably <laughs> wouldn't get, get in onto the front cover. Um, so, yeah, um, it could be yeah. a bit search too, I suppose, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I guess the, the interesting thing about a word like rooted is that it really is one of those words, Australian English words, that really just doesn't quite translate um, to other countries. So I mean, I've noticed on social media a few people kind of commenting in relation to my book who've made jokes around that. So I think, yeah, it's definitely one of those, those words that, a vulgarism that doesn't quite, um, not quite understood by, by people if they're not Australian. Have we been using it for long? When, when did people sort of start using? Oh gosh, I think our first uh, evidence is 1940s, 1930s, well, probably, I've got yeah, well, yeah. I've got an Andy right, right here. Um, so, and most of our evidence is post World War II. Um, yeah. But the origin is 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 still out. Well, Bruce Moore's etymology in in A and D two is um, still uncertain. So unclear whether it comes from root meaning penis or whether there's some other etymology. So there's still work to be done. <laughs> Getting to the root of root, as it were. <laughs> the root of root. Um, and I guess that sort of you know it, it leads to the question of what is distinctive about Australian bad language, about Australian swearing. I mean, are we a nation of potty mouths? Um, uh, you know, um, you frame this as very much a national history. And, and of course, a lot of your work has been around Australian language use. So I'm just wondering, are, are there kind of distinctive patterns that, that, that are recognisably Australian? Yeah, I mean, I guess one of the, the, one of the things that I try to track through is kind of this reputation that Australia gains very early on, Australian colonies gain early on for, um, you know, for its bad language, for its offensive language of vanities, which, which dates back to, to the, the convict colonies and, and the colonial visitors who come here and, and say that they hear so much swearing in the streets. Um, and then by the end of the 19th century, there's kind of this distinctive mythology, which Australians are almost embracing around the idea of bad language. I mean, I, do, I mean, I, I've been asked, you know, do we swear more? Um, I don't think you can kind of make that kind of objective um, assessment to say, yeah, we swear more than than any other country. I think perhaps more is around the attitudes that we have towards swearing that we're, and 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 it depends very much on the context and who you're talking about. I think as well. Um, but arguably, we perhaps do have a more relaxed attitude around swearing. Having said yeah. that, of course, there's this other theme that I track through the book, which is really one of, one of censorship. So um, there's kind of these tensions between this embrace of, of, of swearing on the one hand and the kind of desire for respectability on the other. Yeah, I mean, I guess from my own cultural roots, I mean, my impression's always been that, you know, in the Italian case, for instance, it's blasphemy that's regarded as really offensive. And, and you know, so I mean, I, I guess if you're talking about on the era, I mean, what was regarded as foul language? You know, was it bloody, that sort of stuff? I mean, what, yeah, what were the kind of things? Yeah, I mean, when we track our whole, you know, I was able to track a whole range of words. I mean, there was the sort of bloody, damn, bastard, I mean, rascal, which was considered a fairly strong insult at the time. Um, but there's also evidence of, of words like cunt being used in that period as well. So, so there's a range of it there. I mean, it's always, you know, difficult to sometimes track down some of that language and you have to kind of try and, and find some of the traces, traces of yeah. it. Yeah. And I guess places like, you know, court records and things like that are, are useful for this kind of work, you know, where people, are, are, where, those moments of transgression, I guess, where people break the law and there's, there's some sort of disruption where it, it, it ends up in the public sphere. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> 
Um, and, and, is a and is a concern, so also in colonial newspapers where they are talking about, um, well, certainly up until the middle of the 19th century, they are very concerned about this reputation that Australia has for, for its bad language and what is the effect of having all of this language circulating publicly on the streets. I'm um, just yeah. going back to the idea of the sort of distinctive swearing. I mean, I think one of the other things that's quite interesting about the, the, the four Bs, bloody bastard, bugger and bullshit, which is <laughs> sort of distinctively Australian. I mean, is that you see some of those words really um, coming to have, even though they're used elsewhere, coming to have um, special senses or connotations here in Australia. So, of course, bloody is the great Australian adjective, but the Oxford English Dictionary also points out that um, the amelioration of bloody happens first in Australia. So we are the first country to, to kind of stop seeing it as, as one of the, the great swear words. And, and some of the senses of bugger as well are, are uniquely Australian. Yeah, like silly old bugger, which Bob Hawke, I remember, used on one occasion. I mean, that always struck me as a, a particularly Australian way of using that, that, that term. Yeah. 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 Um, how much of our swearing has its its roots again um, in country life, in rural life. I mean, obviously, there's a huge literature, isn't there, on on the, the role that the bush plays in informing national identity. You know, the Shearers, Henry Lawson, Bush Rangers, and and the whole Russell Ward argument in the Australian Legion. Um, where, where does swearing sit within that that kind of argument? Yeah, I, mean, I think it was interesting to sort of track. Um, you know, I've sort of got a chapter on the bush and a chapter on the city. And I think it's really interesting to see the way in which swearing in bush contexts really ties into this whole emerging bush mythology um, that really excuses or defends the use of swearing. So the bullock driver, of course, is the notorious swearer. Um, you know, he's got his intrans intransigent bullocks, he can't get them to move, so he's using this bad language. He kind of becomes this iconic figure in, in Australian popular culture in the late 19th century. Mm -hmm. And the bushman to some extent as well. Um, and then that kind of has its culmination with the digger in the First World War, where he's also got reasons for swearing, so that's okay, you know, it's acceptable in those contexts. And then on the other hand, you have this um, late 19th century, early 20th century um, discussion of bad language in the city, which connects it, uh, which is much more negative, I think, about it. Um, and it's, it's that continuation of the mid middle 19th century preoccupation with respectability and, um, you know, public order, not wanting to hear this language in public linking it to drunkenness um, and, and so forth. So you kind of have these two themes, if you like, that are running um, side by side. But it's definitely the Bush mythology, I think, that goes a long way towards um, legitimising at least the milder bad language, the bloodies and the bastards and the, and the dams, um, through those figures, those iconic male figures, and they are male figures, the, the Bushman and the bullock driver, and then, and then in the First World War, the digger. And of course, Joseph Furphy's Such Is Life, you know, which he wrote under the pseudonym Tom Collins, is about bullockies, isn't it? And it's full of, of phrases like, you know, sort of by Sheol and this sort of thing as in place of hell. Obviously, hell was regarded as something that was not to be printed in, in around the turn of the century. Yeah, yeah, and often disguised. And so all of that yeah. language is, uh, and the other thing I tracked really um, through the late 19th century, which I found really interesting was the, the variety of disguises. So not just the, the dash or the asterisk, but all the <laughs> euphemisms that come into, come into use through this period as Australian print culture is really, really taking off. So, so that was kind of- yeah. Are there intersections in the, particularly the, the rural stuff, I guess, with, with indigenous language? I mean, is there any crossover that you've found with that? No, not really, not in, not in, the, not in the bad language sphere. I mean, one of the, one of the, the themes in the 19th century is really um, talking about the corruption of indigenous people by, um, you know, the, the shepherds and the bushmen who are out there and are corrupting um, indigenous people. And one of the themes there is, is that they are, that the indigenous people are picking up um, the bad language. The bad language, yeah. Like, and that, that's a kind of recurring theme that's um, of concern. Yeah, that's interesting, yeah. And what about women and men? I mean, I guess probably up to this point, 
um, we've mainly had an image in our mind of, of a hard swearing male, a bullocky, a, a shearer, these were all very male, exclusively male occupations, certainly shearing was. Um, how, how, you know, what do we what do we learn about gender patterns? About you know what what, do, what does a look at at, at swear or glance at bad language, you know, give us in terms of a window onto onto gender relations in Australian history? Yeah, I mean, like I said, I mean, I think one of the interesting things about um, the the kind of discourse around acceptable swearing is how masculinist it is. So that mythology of the, the bushman and the bullock driver and the digger, and it's acceptable for them to swear. I mean, more broadly speaking, scholars who have written about gender and swearing have, you know, talked about how swearing is very much um, part of the male domain. So you think about all male communities, military or sports or those kinds of arenas where, um, you know, swearing has particular functions, you know, bonding, um, the use of insults and abusive language. And then on the other hand, of course, women and this long history of, of being um, regarded as, as the sort of guardians of morality and respectability, that that's their, um, uh, you know, responsibility to sort of keep language clean. And so in the 19th century, the kind of working class woman who challenges that, who uses bad language, who's drinking at the pub, who's you know, swearing at her husband <laughs> or at her neighbour is, is seen to be particularly transgressive. Um, and so there's a lot of conversation about that in the colonial press. And that and that's sort of those sort of norms around swearing, I think, are certainly still there right through. I mean, if you think about something like Nancy Keesing's Lily on the Dustbin, um, she talks a little bit about that and how many of the women she interviews, so that comes out in the 1980s, but many of the women she interviews would have, you mm. know, yeah, 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s, um, that they really talk about they're not using that language, but using lots of euphemisms. So she, you know, muddy great bucket of pitch, I think is one of the ones <laughs> she uses. Um, and good gravy is another one she cites. Um, so, I mean, it's hard to know, you know, how honest they were being about the language they used when they were talking to, to Kizik. Mm -hmm. But um, I thought that was, that was kind of interesting. And then you see things shift more um, in recent decades um, where, you know, I don't think the, the linguistic scholarship shows this as well, is that women um, are more likely to be using um, bad language. So it's, you know, it has shifted um, somewhat in the last couple of decades, but I think there's still, um, you know, these kind of uh, double standards or, or gendered um, notions around who's allowed to swear and who's not allowed to swear. You know, who, you know, where can we celebrate? And I mean, you still see this, you know, if, I don't know, a sportsman um, uses bad language, he's kind of a larrikin and he's to be celebrated, whereas um, I think it's still not quite as acceptable um, when it comes to sort of women public figures using that kind of language. And, and uh, we'll perhaps talk a bit more about, you know, the sort of breaking taboos in a moment when we look at the, the more recent past. But going further back, I mean, you've already hinted at this. I mean, Australia, you know, it's sometimes been compared with Ireland, hasn't it, as a, as a very censored society. And this is something I've written about too in the work I did on, on sexuality in Australia. Um, but I, I wonder, you know, how, how the taboos and, and restrictions have actually changed across, across the years. You've already talked about the, the 19th century quite a lot. I mean, um, you know, how, how have the restrictions changed, um, you know, as, as we've got perhaps deeper into the 20th century? Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Like I said, I mean, it's it's those offensive language laws that come into into place very early in in, um, mm. in the Australian colonies in the nineteenth century, which is then used to control public behaviour. Um, but the other main mechanism, I guess, is censorship. So. I mean, you know, you probably speak to this as well in terms of um, the censorship in the late 19th century, but it's a bit haphazard. It's a bit, you know, mm. we're just going to stop these books from coming in and it's a bit patchy. But by the, you know, post-World War I, there's this real regime of censorship that, that comes into place. Um, and, I mean, that's also when you're seeing this, this shift, if you like, for, from the religious language, the bloodies and the bastards have by now largely become somewhat legitimate to the you know the fucks and the cunts um, that that are starting to become visible so you're starting to see them in print 
Um, and, you know, Nicole Moore's work on, on interwar literary censorship, I think, is really interesting in terms of talking about this. So bad language is targeted. So the, you know, the four letter words are targeted, but it's part of a broader preoccupation, um, you know, with, uh, with sexuality, with deviant sexual, deviant, put inverted commas, um, sexuality, um, which is then linked into notions of radicalism and so on. So it's often bad language is just part of this concern to censor this language um, in, you know, sorry, censor print through this period. Um, it's about, you know, preventing this stuff from, from coming in. So. There are other just, work there as well, I guess. Yeah, I, I just remembered while you were talking, Amanda, that um, uh, Robert Close in Love Me Sailor, which of course earned him a short prison sentence uh, in the 1940s, uh, used rutting instead of fucking. I mean, clearly he meant fucking, but he, he said rutting all the way through the book. Um, R W, uh, sorry, R U W T I N G. Yeah. Um, was that a was that a kind of that kind of device? common, you know, amongst authors to, to kind of just pick something that was so obviously standing in for something else? Yeah, I mean, I, I talk a little bit about um, the middle parts of Fortune and um, her, her Private Suite, is that the two titles oh. of the book? Um, oh. And how when the expurgated version was um, published, they replaced the fuck and fucking with muck and mucking, but not in every instance. So some of them were actually disguised with just bloody and whatever, um, which is kind of interesting. And what I traced as I was looking at a lot of these instances was that where it talked about um, battle and combat, the more serious aspects of the First World War experience, it tended to use the muck and mucking. So, you know, any reader would know exactly what the language mm. was that was being used there. Whereas where it was disguised with, with something like bloody, of course, you wouldn't know whether that was what he actually meant to write or, or whether it was a disguise. So I thought that was quite interesting. I mean, yeah, there's a whole range. I mean, through um, a lot of those novels at that period, there's a whole range of disguises. I mean, I think Norman Mailer uses, um, in The Naked and the Dead, he uses fugging as, as, a, as a disguise. And I mean, they're pretty thin disguises, really. I mean, we're talking about, you know, you know a reader's really going to know um, exactly what's um, intended, I think. Hey, Chair. So if we could perhaps move now into the period where such disguises became uh, increasingly uncommon, I guess. Um, and I, I wondered what role swearing played in the social revolutions of the 1960s and 1970s. I'm thinking there, obviously, of, of, of feminism. Um, um, oh, I guess gay liberation would be another. Um, you know, so what, what role did, did um, swearing play in, in, you know, the quite dramatic change that I think we get from, certainly from about the mid 1960s onwards? Yeah, well, I mean, I think a, a couple of different, different ways in which um, swearing and bad language functions. I mean, on the one hand, you've sort of got the kind of countercultural use of four letter words simply to shock. So, Jermaine Greer is a feminist and she claims um, a word like fuck um, as a feminist thing, but she also, you know, participates in this counter-cultural counter, counter movement where a lot of it is, is and that language is used. <laughs> purely to kind of shock the establishment. How far can we go? Um, One thinks of Wendy Bacon too, who, um, uh, Amanda, uh, uh, you know, um, who um, was the poem that she published in Ferenka, the uh, Kant is a Christian word, I believe it was called. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, so there's this kind of shock value that this language has to kind of challenge the, the establishment. And there's also the, the sort of defiance and the protest. So, you know, fuck the Vietnam War. <laughs> there's a lot of that um, as part of the, the kind of protest movement as well. The other thing I think that's interesting in terms of the, the use of those kinds of words is that, of course, you're also having these, and this is again your area of expertise, the shifting attitudes towards sexuality. So claiming these mm. words as part of a, of a shift in the way you talk about women's bodies. So women kind of claiming their bodies and using words like fucking cunt um, mm -hmm. as a, a part of, of their language around that. 
um, but also the shifting language around sexuality. So, um, you know, being perhaps more pragmatic in terms of how um, these uh, bodily functions are, are being uh, described. So I think that's, that's another thing that's going on in these um, revolutions. The other thing that I find really interesting about this period is, of course, the challenge um, to challenge a di the challenge to a different sort of bad language, which is the challenge to discriminatory language. So this is a period where um, there's starting to be these challenges to sexist language, racist language, homophobic language, and terminology becomes really important. So by from the 1970s and then really seeing its its fulfillment or some fulfillment partially in the 1980s um, you know changing sexist language in in government and, and in public discourse um, so that's a, another important part of that a recognition of the power of language i guess um, and the power of language to reflect the kind of structures of oppression that really affected um, you know these groups that were Mm. or in their activism through this period. Great. Now, the question's are already coming in, I see, but please feel free to post any questions um, that you've got to the, the Q&A function, and we'll get to those very shortly. Um, I just wanted to, to finish up, really, Amanda. I mean, where are we today with all this? Is it a case of, you know, anything goes? I guess earlier you hinted that the more egalitarian gender relations that have emerged uh, you know, in the last 30, 40 years have, have affected swearing amongst men compared with women or women compared with men. But, you know, can you kind of get away with anything these days? Where are we at the moment? Are there still some taboos? Yeah, I mean, I think what our notion of taboo is has certainly shifted. Um, so discriminatory language is increasingly, I mean, racist language I think is definitely taboo now um, in terms of public discourse. And I think increasingly other forms of discriminatory language are beginning to be treated in that sort of way. So a word like um, slut um, may well be um, disguised you know, online and, or in the print media. So I think those kinds of taboos are, are definitely in place and strengthening, I think, as well. So I think you definitely see a strengthening of those kinds of taboos. But of course, that um, area is, is fraught. I mean, there's a, a reasonable backlash, I think, through people who would talk about this as, well, politically correct or, or more recently as, as kind of woke, wokest, um, um, uh, it, I don't know what you call it, wokest activism. I'm not sure <laughs> what the right... It's woke, I think they say, don't they? Woke activism. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think that's a kind of fraught area that's still working itself yeah. out as to where that goes. Um, in terms of the, the sort of traditional swear words like um, the F word and the C word, I mean, I think it's really interesting because even as I've been talking about this book in, in various media forums, you know, I wound up having these discussions with, um, you know, radio or print media about what words are acceptable and what words are going to be disguised and so on. And I think, um, you know, it's, yeah, the F word and the C word are still disguised in, in many forums, but not all. So you will still see some online news sites that, that wouldn't bother to, to disguise some of that. But I think, you know, we're definitely, um, I don't think we see anything like the kinds of um, taboos around those words. And I think one of the things I track in the last um, chapter is really a trend at the moment, which is the amelioration of the C word. So a greater level of acceptability. And, and I cite in my example in there is, is reality television, which, you know, everyone would be horrified probably that I, I watched Married at First Sight and The Bachelor Australia, but I didn't watch The Bachelor Australia, um, <laughs> the reason that they used the word dog cunt, but um, it was a topic of much discussion and the use of the C word on uh, Married at First Sight. And, you know, those are prime time reality television shows with a huge following and they were censored, the, words, the, the C word was censored, but everyone knew exactly what was being talked about. And there was a huge amount of discussion in online forums and social media around the word. And increasingly, you know, we'd see it being referred, disguised still on social media, but you'd see it being used. And we're seeing new formations, you know, new compounds. Um, you know, I mentioned dog cunt, which seems to be an Australianism. <laughs> <laughs> and shit cunt. That's another one. Yes. I mean, I think... Poor, uh, yes. I mean, someone, uh, 
um, was chasing, was chasing <laughs> Senator Fanny, uh, Senator, sorry, Senator Anning, I should say, who were uh, at airport uh, a year or two ago, and uh, uh, yes, was uh, gave us all an education in, uh, in 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 that particular word. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I think the fact that we um, are accepting that word more is why we're now seeing creati more creativity around. So you're actually seeing these various of our forms. So I think, you know, I mean, not everyone agrees with it when I say, or, you know, are quite kind of horrified when I say, how could this possibly be? But I think um, it's definitely, definitely a trend, certainly amongst us, you know, the certainly younger people, I'd say, to, to some extent. Um, and I even saw it the other day on social media or Twitter, somebody had asked one, you know, those questions where everybody kind of replies. And this was something like, what is the most Australian word or something? And, and somebody suggested the C word as their answer. So, it's not very Australian. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, and yeah. also the, the kind of using it almost as a term of affection is, the, is that seems to be out there as well. So it, it's, you know, I had to say it's one of these words we're watching, but it kind of is <laughs> one of these words we're watching. Because <laughs> Things right now, I can't. You know, I'm. I'm a little. One, one test, I guess, Amanda, in your other role as 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 um, uh, you know, as, as director of the National Dictionary Centre. I mean, how far would you go with word of the year? Ah, oh, this is an interesting. <laughs> Well, look, you know, everyone criticises what, I mean, it doesn't really matter what you have. I mean, some people love it, some people hate it, some people agree with it, some people don't. So, I don't know. I mean, I think the ANU Media Office would probably be my censor for anything that was too <laughs> you probably, I'm just picturing them trying to justify shit, but it'd be hilarious. <laughs> joke about about dog cunt as a possibility <laughs> as, as for the short list i think last year when, yeah. when we became aware of it so you know <laughs> just in case this is causing anyone out there alarm it was it was iso this year iso which is good clean fun really isn't it um yes and so, by scott morrison so i think we've got the scott morrison seal of approval which oh, you know, terrific. we all want <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Something I'm dying to ask you, Amanda, before we get into the questions, maybe someone's already posted it, is I think, you know, it'd, it'd be useful to work out how many of these swear words were invented by Barry Humphreys, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> at some point or other. Quite a lot, I suspect. Yeah, I mean, Barry Humphreys is kind of such an interesting figure. Like, I couldn't kind of leave him out, even though so many of his words probably better fall into that category of vulgarism um, rather, you know, vulgar colloquialism rather than, than a swear word per se. But it's just that kind of wonderful creativity around describing <laughs> bodily functions in this kind of, um, well, in, a, in the way that only he can. So, um, yeah, yeah, definitely always has to have this place in, in Australian English for better or worse, I guess. <laughs> okay, well, thanks, Amanda. Now I'm going to go to the... Q and A. Um, so our, our first um, is from uh, Michelle, who was asking. Um, we seem to find swearing funny or amusing. Um, is that itself an Australian characteristic? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really interesting question. I mean, certainly something I track through the book is the the presence of swearing or the use of swearing in comedy. So in the 19th century, I mean, a lot of those stories that are talking about the bullock driver um, or the Bushman or even the digger in the First World War, a lot of those stories are um, funny. They are humorous anecdotes, um, mm. popular um, stories about using bad language. I don't think it's only in Australian characteristics, you know, the use of bad language. I mean, if you think about a lot of American comedians, um, you know, even when they were breaking the taboos in the 1960s made use of, of language. But, um, but yeah, it's definitely been a, a, a theme and a trend um, from the 19th century through to the present, I think. And in my final chapter, I also talk now about some of the women comedians who I think have been um, quite uh, distinctive. Um, Kath and Kim are the ones I cite in the book, but I think Kitty Flanagan is another one. I, I don't know her humour as much, but um, she uses, um, a, you know, swearing to great effect in, in her humour as well. 
Great, thanks Amanda. That was from Michelle Smith, I should mention. So next we've got David Bailey, who's asking, at what point did American expressions start to be significant in our language? I presume that's American ad language or swear words. Yeah, I mean, I think it's inter you know, it's interesting. I mean, I, I sort of wonder how much we've kind of taken on a lot of those American um, swear words. I mean, if you think about something like motherfucking, it's not, it's not, uh, well, I don't know, you know, my sense is that it's not a, it's not a word that's used a lot in Australian swearing. So, I mean, certainly, I mean, if you want to sort of argue about the American influence on Australian English, or sorry, on the, on English in Australia, you sort of be going back to, um, you know, the 1920s, 1930s, I guess, where you start to see real concern about the American influence on our language. Um, we certainly consume a huge amount of American um, bad language through through films. So I'm thinking about you know film uh, t TV shows like The Sopranos um, in the 1990s, which really mm. helped to break down some of the break down. I don't know, challenge some of those taboos around bad language on television. Um, mm. Yeah. Sorry, that's probably not a great answer to your question. I mean, I guess I'm trying to think of what are some of these distinctive uh, American swear words and to what extent we would really use them here. Well, there's a bit of a literature on on um, um, the gay subcultures, isn't there? So the, the, the um, presence of, of um, uh, gay American servicemen in Australia in the yeah, 1940s yeah. Um, is apparently the origins of the, the use of the word cocksucker. For instance, you know, oh, which, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, but that's actually, that's actually um, interestingly enough, um, Downing's 1919 book of, of digger language uses has ha, interestingly has cocksucker as cocksucker mm. to kind of represent the American um, pronunciation of that word. So, yeah, yeah. That's, that's probably a good example of yeah. that. Great, um, thanks, Amanda. Now, David's also followed up, fascinated by the difference between rooting us and barracking in australia do we know how that happened yeah that's interesting i feel like i've got my australian national dictionary right next to me and i wanted to just double check the first date of the term barracking um there's some been there's some really interesting work done on um barracking culture by matthew klugman um who's done some some fascinating work on on the development of that culture yeah so 1878 um, yeah, um, I don't quite know why that um, term really takes off in the way that it does. Um, just reading the etymology here. Yeah, it's one of those etymologies that says it could be this or it could be that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, not perhaps mm. particularly helpful, but definitely 1870s, 1880s is where you're seeing the first usages of the word barracking. And it really, I mean, and you know, look at the mm. end, and there's just a huge amount of evidence for that word. It just seems to, to I was about to say, take root here in Australia. <laughs> yeah, we can't yeah. away from this word. Um, take root here in Australia and becomes the word that, that we use. But but what explains the difference? Um, I'm not sure. Now we have a, a question, um, a nuts and bolts question here from Buddha Al Alami. Is the book available in the library? Well, I hope so. You can, you can borrow it from me. <laughs> you can borrow it from me. I'm happy to lend you a copy. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a better idea. Go to your branch of the, you know, the ACT library or wherever you happen to be and ask them to buy a copy. That'd be the best <laughs> way to do it. And uh, it'll be there for anyone who wants to read it. So thank you for that question, which, is a, is a most important one at any book launch, actually. And uh, now we've got a question here from um, Kim Belmano, who is asking a really interesting question. Can you talk about age-related swearing, bad language, please? My nine and 10-year-old boys are fascinated by swearing and use it often for shock factor. What about teenagers? Do we grow out of it? Personally, I doubt it, suggests Kim. Yeah, I mean, I think I've got some interesting um, information drawing on, on, you know, scholars who have done um, very detailed research about swearing um, and and the youth and and use use of it by children, um, and that's really interesting in terms of how quickly or how soon that children learn the, pretty much the full range of swear words and and start using it. Um, so even though we often want to protect children from hearing these words. They're generally pretty, um, you know, familiar with these words. Um, the other thing I say in my introduction is that you learn quite early on 
when you should use them and not use them. So I think it's interesting that you say um, your boys kind of use it as shock factor. So they kind of know that they're not supposed to do it and they're, and they're using it for the shock factor. Um, I think they do say, uh, I can't remember the exact um, sort of age period where the, it starts to, where, where the use of bad language peaks. I think it is the teenage years and, and then changes. But, um, you know, I think we continue to use um, bad language. Um, it might also depend quite a bit on, on the individual, I guess, as to, to what extent you you use bad language because you, you as a, you know, as a as a child because it shocks, and as a teenager because you're rebelling, and and then don't bother so much with it later, or if it's really part of your active vocabulary that you use all the time. We've got a similar one here from Emily Gallagher, who knows a thing or two about children and tr and children's yeah. history. Um, yes. Thanks so much, Frank and Amanda. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, there's been some work on children swearing in obscene language. Um, does the book explore the history of children's bad language thought? Do you have much to say in the book about it? Yeah, thanks, Emily. You're probably the expert on this. Um, but yeah, I talk a little bit about um, children swearing generally in the introduction, but then I mostly use um, June... Factor. There's a June dictionary. Factor? A dictionary kids speak. Is it June, fa June Factor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kids, the Kids Speak Dictionary. Mm. Um, so I use that. And I, one of the things that's quite interesting about that is just the creativity around some of the language that Australia, that was recorded by her in that dictionary. So that's the main thing that I've got. I haven't, I, I didn't come across a whole lot else, but I'm imagining that you probably in your research will have come across um, you know, perhaps um, more lived experience in examples of that. So I'd, I'd be interested to hear, you know, what you might have found in, in your research at some stage. Now, we've got some um, very glad tidings from David Bailey. Rooted is already available electronically from the ACT Library Service. Um, and David is halfway through it himself already. So that's um, Ian Matthews, most of our swear words are ancient. When are we likely to create some new ones? Asked Ian. Yeah, it, a good question. I mean, one of the books I was reading, uh, which was, I think, about, I can't remember if it was about British or American vulgar language, um, but the, the author kind of argued that because most of the taboos were, were no longer operative, that we were probably likely not to, not to create new ones. But I kind of, I kind of would argue against that because what I talk about in my final chapter, I mean, some of the things I tracked... Um, there's, there's so much creativity around language on social media. And so, I mean, we talked earlier about these, some, these elaborations on, on the C word um, as, as a couple of examples. So something like dog cunt is quite new. Uh, and, I'm you know, saying that, don't you, Amanda? <laughs> I do. I love it. No, I love it because I think it's an Australianism, you know, it's going to make it into the next edition of A&D, Pride of Place. Uh, <laughs> But also emoji swearing was an, is another thing that I talk about there. I don't know if anybody makes regular use of emoji swearing. So that was kind of another interesting, um, fairly recent um, innovation, if you like, in, in swearing. So, um, you know, I think there's, there's, still, there's still some opportunities there, if you like, to see some new words coming into um, the vocabulary. I guess the only thing that maybe mitigates against that is even though there's all this kind of creative people coming up with new words and combinations of words on social media, will any of them really take off to be used more generally? That's maybe a, you know, at this point, maybe an un unanswerable question because we don't know, but um, yeah, maybe we need a campaign <laughs> you know, to up the use of some of these words. Of Start the dog cunt campaign, uh, uh, Amanda, it's <laughs> obviously a particular favourite of yours. Now, Michelle Smith, do people remember what happened to Graham Kennedy? Well, I do believe that I know the incident to which Michelle is referring. Do you have a response to that, Amanda? Do you know what happened to Graham Kennedy? This, I imagine, yeah, would be, no. this would be the crow call, wouldn't it? Is that right, Michelle? I think that, I imagine this is the 1975 crow call where, of course, Graham yelled out um, on TV, pretending to be a crow, fuck, 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 fuck. Um, but of course, you know, um, it had a, a very clear double entendre. So I think he was suspended from the air, wasn't he, for some time around that incident? Yeah, I think he was. 
from the show, but I think there was also this thing about, didn't, didn't they say he had to be pre-recorded, which he didn't like, and then he said something about a politician? And they cut it out. Yeah, it was it was um, Doug, Doug McClelland, who was the communications yeah. minister for me. Yeah, and they yeah. had a bit about that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I talk about that, and I also talk about blankety blanks, which of course is what oh, I really yeah. want to do. Um, yeah. which of course, very much played up. You know, yes, okay, we can't say these things on TV, but we can kind of very much hear <laughs> you know, right. what these, these words might be. So the you know the double entendre became very much um, part of of the shtick of that song, was the point of that show, I guess. Yes, for the young people out there, there's many, many episodes on, on YouTube. So go and have a look at it. Blanket, blankety Blanks with Graham Kennedy. And I think Peter the Phantom Puller was the person behind the thing who used to pull the, 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 the kind of slots for him. It was all very, all very suggestive. And I think on at seven o'clock of an evening. Um, uh, we've got to hear one from Joshua Black. Um, Josh. Uh, so says Nick, Nick Darnforth has argued that the language of Australian political culture has historically been, been very tawdry and poor. Was this something that appeared prominent in your journey through the primary and secondary material? So I suppose that's a question about about swearing in in political culture, perhaps, or, or you know, um, the language of politics. Yeah, um, yeah, a really interesting question, and I kind of thought politics would probably feature a bit more than it wound up doing in the book. So at the beginning, I was going to have this whole chapter upon politics and sports, and both of which seems somehow dropped out, dropped by the wayside, and I'm not quite sure why. Um, I didn't, I guess I didn't find a huge amount of stuff on politics. I mean, I talk a little bit about when the, the first um, swear words start getting used well, not so much first used in Parliament, but first recorded in Hansard, which is a different, uh, a different story. So I talk a little bit about that. Um, but I think, it, you know, I think that's perhaps a whole other project in a way. I mean, maybe Frank, maybe this comes into what you're working on, Frank, uh, in terms of thinking about Australian politics, because I think there would be some interesting work to do around the, the kind of language of, of Australian political culture. I mean, there were some funny stories. I mean, there was I can't quite remember the exact details, but there, there was a funny story when Andrew Peacock, I think, was recorded in his car. Oh, yes, it was a car phone with Jeff Kennett. Yeah, with Jeff yeah, Kennett. Yeah, yeah. That's right. And he, and he yeah. quite a lot of um, uh, swear words. I don't know if that damaged his political career, Frank, do you? Uh, it, didn't do, it didn't do the career of Peacock or Jeff Kennett much, much good. They were referring to John Howard and... And yeah, there were a lot of F and C words involved. Yes, um, but it's a it's a great question, and 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 you know something for another project, I think. In fact, yeah, no, great. Now, oh yes, now Cherry Gladman's asking <laughs> when the audio book is coming out, and I suppose the other question might be, who would one, uh, who would you get to 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 read it? Who would be? Well, Amanda actually is doing a very good job here, but. Do you have any other suggestions? To, 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 you know, say it all. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Perhaps write to my publisher. They haven't mentioned it, so I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> now, this one's from Cass Bishop. Thanks, Amanda and Frank. Um, Cass is relaying a question from Richard White. Um, can you identify social media as having any influence on swearing in any way? Yeah, I mean, look, I talk uh, quite a bit about social media in the final chapter. Um, I guess in terms of an info, I mean, certainly swearing is used in social media. Um, there's questions about, you know, what you can get away with and what you can't get away with. Um, seems some people get targeted for using bad language in a way that others don't. So that's a kind of interesting thing. One of the things I talk about um, in the book is also how um, abusive language targets people in social in the social media sphere. So I talk quite a bit about how women, in particular women of colour, get targeted um, by abusive language um, in the social media sphere. So, yeah, I mean, there's a whole range of interesting things that are, that's going on in social media. And as I said um, just a little while ago, um, also creativity around making, you know, making up um, various combinations of swear words and, and euphemistic um, insults and those kinds of things on social media. So, you know, as with language more generally, I mean, social media is certainly um, doing some interesting things uh, uh, in this area. Thanks. 
So thanks to Kath and Richard. Thanks, Amanda. Um, David Bailey, love wanker. Got to be the Australian swear word. Covers everything. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, do, 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 do you have any thoughts on wanker, Amanda? You know, when I became a historian, I never thought I'd be sitting asking someone <laughs> that question. But please go ahead. <laughs> It's a, you know, look, life and days, you know, it is a, it's a, it's a word worth bringing out, you know, using in, in various contexts, I think it's, um, yeah. I mean, I mean, just in terms of the Australian, Australian this, I mean, it's not sort of exclusively Australian, but I think the way in which we use it, which is, um, you know, I won't really say it's not it's not affectionate it's 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 directly, <laughs> but I I think in 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 say in Britain where it's also used it's 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 considered more taboo than it is here I think we have a, a you know a more tolerant uh, attitude towards that word. Um, now this is from David Roth. David's um, pointing out unlike other languages which use a lot of English swear words, Australian English doesn't use a lot of loan words except perhaps U.S. words. Can you suggest why? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. I mean, I wonder to what extent it is about this kind of mythology that we've built around these particular words. I mean, to calling something like bloody the great Australian adjective early on, um, you know, a variety of other words that very much become identified with the Australian character or the Australian identity, the sort of typical, you know, stereotypical um, male Australian. Perhaps that mitigates against using um, many borrowed words. So you kind of have this vocabulary that you identify as being very much part of um, Australian English that is distinctively Australian and, and it continues to be part of part of our language. Now Ch Cherry Gladman is, is <laughs> reminding us Having a bit of fun with us, I think, here, Politi uh, bringing up the question of politics again, and uh, the country member. Do you remember that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I can't remember who he uses it of. You'd know that, Frank. Um, yeah, it's the one where, well, I mean, the way it's usually told is someone or other says, I can't remember who it, who it is, but says, I'm a country member. And then the reply is, yes, we remember. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I wanted to use that actually, and I struggled to find an like an actual like, like it was used. Like I think Whitlam told the story later, and that was the only evidence I could find of it. And I really wanted to find the original so that I could. Yeah. It didn't make it in, but it was one of the things that I had on my, you know, in my notes, and I, and I almost used it, but then, but then didn't. So yeah, because it's a good. Yes. Story. It is a good story. It could be apocryphal, like the one that's supposed to, I've, I've seen attributed to John McEwen, who was, of course, country party leader for many years, who pointed out that the young young Labor had become young Labs and young lib Liberals had become young Libs, but the country party wouldn't be following suit. Um, <laughs> but I, I don't know if he ever actually said it. Um, one from Kim here again, Kim Bolmano. Thank you so much, Amanda and Frank. Thank you. I have a photographic memory. Fantastic references to the 1970s. Yeah, I have a photographic memory for, for um, a trivial 70s pop culture, I guess. Um, I use swearing as a way to feel free of constraints. It's a little attempt at regaining my power when it feels compromised, but I don't think I use it aggressively. Aggressive swearing makes my hair stand on end. I hate it. Do you think that's associated um, to, to lower socioeconomic circumstances? Which is a very good question because I did want to ask you as well, Amanda, about class, actually. Class and swearing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I certainly talk about class and swearing in um, the 19th century context and through into the into the 20th century. Um, certainly in terms of, of the kind of stigmatizing of the working classes as being more likely to be swearers. Um, you know, I think, I think it's kind of tricky, though, to, to kind of talk about it in class terms coming through the 20th century. I think there's this, I mean, it is this kind of tension where there's this kind of Australian-ness identity that's very strong. Um, yeah, look, yeah, so it's a tricky question. I mean, I think there, there's kind of still those stereotypes there. I mean, I think some people might argue, you know, the sort of stereotypical bogan is more likely to use that language. But I mean, I think as, you know, just talking about somebody like Andrew Peacock, <laughs> you know, using those words pretty liberally in his conversation with Jeff Kennett. I mean, I think you do see um, swearing ranging across across the classes. 
Um, certainly in terms of the evidence that I've found, um, which, you know, I haven't done a scientific study correlating class and, and bad language um, currently. Um, I'm not sure who might be working on that particular topic, but I think, um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. Just in terms of your, your other part of your, quest, uh, your comment, um, talking about swearing as a way to feel free of constraints. I mean, I think that's an, an interesting thing as well. Um, you know, my, my, one of my colleagues here at the Dictionary Centre, who swears quite a bit just normally, but she said that after, you know, reading my book, she felt even more um, liberated <laughs> to use swear words. So, um, yeah, I think that, that there is that element to it as well. But of course, swearing takes on these different functions, very much depending on the context, who's using it, whether it's being used in that aggressive way or whether it's something that's being... Um, you know, used for, for bonding with people or just as an exclamation <laughs> in relation to life, which, you know, we all might have felt using a few swear words this year, given how bad it's been. Yes, we, we academics are always being told we have to demonstrate the impact of our work. So, Amanda, you can basically <laughs> say that you have people who feel free to swear. Um, that's, that's, uh, that's an impact. Um, now, Liz, Reimer, has the purpose of swearing changed over time? Yeah, I mean, I guess just just following on from what I was just saying um, in response to Kim, yeah, I mean, I think it, it really very much depends on the context, and I think that's always been the case. Like, I think it's always been the case that um, swearing takes on different functions in different contexts, and I think a lot of those um, basic functions, you know, the idea of using swearing to bond with other people, um, you know, swearing because you're in... Um, bad circumstances. Those things have held pretty true, I think, in terms of swearing. I mean, I guess the, the difference maybe as, as, as time has changed is the way in which we've used um, swearing within popular culture or swearing as a sign of humour and so forth. So those things have maybe changed over time. But in terms of, of the sort of linguistic purpose, a kind of like, you know, how we use pragmatic um, language, I think those functions have, have largely remained the same from, from the research that I've done. <laughs> I think we've got time for two more questions. So one from Kath Bishop. Um, much of what you said might also apply to New Zealand, um, or are there identifiable differences um, and related to that any state differences within Australia? Thanks, Kath, for this question about New Zealand, because, you know, we Australian lexicographers <laughs> love to just claim New Zealand language is our own, <laughs> even when, you know, the fight over Lamington and so forth. Um, yeah, I mean, look, there's, there, there are a few, um, yeah, there was quite a bit of commonality, I think, between some of the language, the Australian language of swearing and New Zealand. Um, <laughs> You know, I think we claim no wucking furries, but it may well be New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I haven't, look, I have to say, I haven't made a huge study of, uh, you know, I, have, I don't know a lot about New Zealand um, bad language. So you probably might be able to, to tell me a bit more about that. But, um, yeah, so I can't really comment on, on to what extent there might be identifiable differences. And as far as state differences within Australia, I, you know, I don't think there, there's really very much at all um, that I've come across, um, but there certainly was some commentary in the 19th century material that um, seemed to target Queensland quite a bit um, <laughs> as being particularly bad. So it was often cited as being, um, you know, the, 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 the area that, of Australia that where you were going to hear more bad language than, than anywhere else. But I do, that, that's not objective evidence. That was just... <laughs> <laughs> Queensland, I think. Yes. Now, here we've got um, a question from someone who does a lot of swearing, most of it at me because it's my wife, Nicole McLennan. Um, given that language shifts over time, is there a lost swear word that Amanda considers oh, we should God. restore to our vocabulary? Do we have a lost swear word that you think we need to start using? Gosh, Nicole, you should have prepared me for this one. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm very fond of some of all the, you know, the kind of late 19th, early 20th century kind of mild, mild oaths and, and curses. Um, there was my cabbage tree. Um, and, you know, there's all those wonderful strike me pink and, you know, strike me blue. We could, we could revise those. Um, yeah, so I'll have to, you know, 
take that one on notice maybe and, and think about that and, and start a campaign around that alongside um, my other campaigns. <laughs> I won't say it again, Frank, because, you know... <laughs> Um, a couple of comments before we a couple of comments before we finish up. Kim Belmano um, regarding Wanker, a campaign in New South Wales had "Don't be a tosser" on the bins. It also reminds me of the tourist campaign that got a very bad rap overseas with "Where the bloody hell are you?" Yeah, and I, I, I talk a little bit about that and in the book, the the tourist campaign. I mean, who can resist? <laughs> Given that it's. Uh, from, from Scott Morrison's time at Tourism Australia. Um, and David Bailey, my wife had never heard a woman swear until we be befriended a female lawyer 38 years ago. She is now liberated and has been catching up since then. So there's a comment from, from David. I was actually reminded of two things I totally forgot until tonight. Obviously, it's some time since I've spoken to anyone about swearing for an hour. Um, and uh, also some time in which a conversation of mine, at any rate, has had so much blue language in it. Um, but I was reminded of two things, and I suppose Australian plays of the 1970s, you know, the, the new drama, if you like, of the period, probably was another part of that revolution that you were talking about earlier. I remember in David Williamson's The Club, and I, I don't know if this is in the play as well as in the film, but I remember old Jock, who's kind of the old, you know, rather cunning old um, uh, club uh, official, um, uses the rhyming slang Wellington Boot for Root, um, I don't know if you've come across that one. And the other one, which I love, and I know a good friend of mine, uh, Jim Davidson, former editor of Mianjin um, and uh, continuing author of many great things. Uh, we both have a particular favourite from Jack Hibbard's play, A Stretch of the Imagination, in which a particular character is described, a woman, as it happens, is described as the best, best route north of Nil, which I love because I'm from Nil. And there's nothing much north of Nil, really. Um, uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a great, you know, um, uh, you know sort of uh, open wheat growing and, and pastoral area. But uh, it, it's a reminder, I guess, of, of, of you know, how important root is as a, as a word in our, in our language. And in this case, I guess, uh, 1970s dramatic culture. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I talk quite a bit about those plays. And I think that I've got a great quote in there where there's somebody in a newspaper complain. I think it's a newspaper report, complaining um, about. So in the well, 19th century, it's the bullock driver who's always be he's always being cited as you know the standard, the gold standard, if you like, of the the notorious swearer. And and this person in in the 1970s says, well, you know. They, the, the, that it's the playwright, it's the modern pl Australian playwright who's really the, the standard now for, for, for swearing. Yes. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the, the rhyming slang because of course that's another, um, you know, real feature. I mean, rhyming slang is not exclusive to Australia, but it's definitely, you know, many uh, rhyming slang terms are exclusively Australian. Um, Wellington, Wellington Boot is one. Um, the Tom, t Tom Tits is another one that goes back to recorded from World War II. So, oh, it goes back yeah. further than that, I think. Yeah, I've come across that one, I think, in yeah. the 19th century, or very similar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, look, thanks so much, Amanda. Congratulations again on the book, everyone, for, for all those wonderful questions and, and comments. It was really terrific question time. I can't think of a better one. Um, Reminder, obviously, the book is available for sale around. Um, one of the, the downsides, I guess, of, of, of our online world at the moment um, is that we can't, you know, say go over to the, the counter and pick up a book. Um, but please do buy it. You'll find it around the place. Um, our own the bookshop on campus, of course, Harry Hartog, I imagine, has copies to man by now. Um, but, uh, you know, you'll, you'll certainly find it in good bookshops at a place near you. So without further ado, many thanks to Amanda for a wonderful conversation. And again, congrats on the book. Thanks so much, Frank. Thank you. Thanks for all the questions. <laughs>